On this podcast, we go one step beyond publications and guidelines to speak directly with leading experts in interventional pulmonology. This podcast will address not only fundamental topics and exciting publications, but also unconventional topics for which the evidence base isn't that robust. The views expressed on this podcast are those of the speaker and not necessarily endorsed by the AABIP. This is your host, Dodit Chadda, an assistant professor at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. And with that, let's dive into the next episode. I'm delighted to introduce our guest today, Dr. Saman Rafek. Dr. Rafek is a Clinical Associate Professor of Medicine and Cardiothoracic Surgery at NYU. There, he also serves as the Associate Director for Interventional Pulmonary, and he is also the Program Director for the IP Fellowship. With him today, I'm going to discuss the technique of combined pleurodesis. Dr. Rafek, thank you for joining me today on the podcast. Thank you very much for having me. Before we start, do we uh, do you have any uh, conflicts of interest to disclose? I do not have any financial conflicts of interest. However, I have to mention that I was a site investigator for the ASAP trial, which uh, um, is uh, quoted in some of the other trials that we're going to discuss today. Perfect. So I'll start with a quick introduction to our topic. So for the definitive management of malignant pleural effusions, IPCs and TALC are both popular with each carrying some advantages over the other. While TALC is a definitive intervention in many, more patients undergoing TALC pleurodesis require further interventions in the future than patients receiving IPCs. IPCs, on the other hand, can be placed under local anesthesia. They are associated with a shorter initial hospital stay and are cheaper in patients surviving less than three months. In addition, 30 to 40% of the patients who have IPCs placed may undergo autopleurodesis, allowing IPC removal. However, the true burden of IPCs on patients and hospital services is realized when we factor in that patients have to go home with a plastic tube and perform a pleural intervention on themselves every day. Complications are also higher with IPCs and they may also lead to unscheduled clinic visits and hospitalizations. But what if we could, you know, combine the benefits of these two techniques? Uh, what I'm talking about here is something called as combined pleurodesis and not the IPC plus protocol. Dr. Rafek, can you please describe for our listeners as to what we mean when we say combined pleurodesis? Combined pleurodesis refers to the use of multiple approaches, so it could be two or even more, uh, to achieve the stated goal, which in this case is pleurodesis in patients with uh, malignant effusions. When we refer to that in many of the, the studies that have been conducted in the past decade or so, it refers usually to the use of talc during a thoracoscopic procedure, which could be done either surgically or medically, and the placement of an indwelling tunnel pleural catheter. So that seems to be the most common reference of combined pleurodesis. However, people have also used the term in the past uh, to describe, as you had mentioned, you know, other uh, approaches such as placement of uh, tunnel pleural catheters with then the use of uh, a talc slurry after, or even a combination of a chest tube and, and use of talc. But for the purpose of our discussion, we will define it as the use of uh, talc pleurodesis uh, during a surgical or a medical thoracoscopy procedure with the placement of an indwelling tunnel pleural catheter. Perfect. So what could be some of the advantages of doing this combined approach? Ideally, you want to get the advantages that you can reach with either approach and combine both together. So we know that pleurodesis, in this case, chemical pleurodesis, with talc being the most commonly used agent, there is a high rate of success, and that's been documented in multiple trials in the past. We also know from the use of indwelling tunnel pleural catheters, what you had alluded to in the introduction, uh, they are easy to place in a trained hand. Uh, they could be done in an outpatient setting. They could also be done with local anesthesia, so save the patients the need for the burden of uh, sedation and uh, general anesthesia. 
But at the same time, the main issues that we're looking for is we want patients to achieve the benefit, meaning control of their symptoms, which is usually achieved once they reach the stage of chlorodesis. So by combining both, we want to achieve a higher rate of chlorodesis in a faster way and also with the shortest duration of hospital stay, if any. Perfect. Thank you so much for that. Mm -hmm. So uh, in my literature review of this topic, I came across four studies that have used this protocol. And a disclaimer that, you know, these, uh, this number of subjects in each study were relatively small. And this, of course, may limit the generalizability of these uh, studies. So there are four studies. Uh, I'll name them really quickly. A study by Reddy in CHESS 2011, which was a 30-patient prospective trial. A study by Folk in CHESS 2011, eight patients retrospective. A study by Dr. Bushaude in JOBIP 2015, prospective 29 patients. And a study by Kochmel in JTD 2016, retrospective 29 patients. So at the most 30 patients uh, in these four trials. And in the studies, the median hospitalization days were only one to three, uh, which is pretty standard for post thoracoscopy. But interestingly, the pleurodesis rates were far superior to patients who just underwent uh, dark insufflation in other studies. And these studies had a rate anywhere between 87 and 93%. And importantly, the TPCs were removed at a median of 6 to 16 days after placement. So these results are amazing, and I know this is being practiced in a few centers. But um, Dr. Rafak, what do you think that is the reason that this protocol has not gained wider acceptance, or is it just the fact that we need further studies? I think, you know, I would start with the last point that you made, which is a very valid point, is the combined number of patients that were studied in these uh, four studies that you've quoted um, mounts up to uh, 98 patients. So it's a, a fairly small sample, and we definitely need larger randomized prospective trials in order to validate the results that we're seeing in these trials. However, with that being said, it's a very delicate and specific patient population where there are a lot of limitations to enrolling such number of patients. And if we look at the uh, time frame of which these uh, studies have taken place, whether it was retrospective or prospective, it took the investigators up to three to four years in any of these trials to get to these numbers that are considered small numbers. So it's not easy to enroll patients in these trials. So I would say that there are multiple factors that uh, um, we can discuss here uh, with regards to uh, the main reasons that uh, this protocol has not been widely uh, used or accepted. Uh, first of all, we address the, the issue of uh, patients' characteristics. Uh, we address the issue about the need for larger randomized controlled trials. Um, there's a, still a lot of heterogeneity when it comes to management of these patients, and we've only started to see uh, more robust science behind the management of malignant pleural effusions in the last decade or so. Certainly, uh, the groups out of the UK have led the way, along with the groups in Australia, Singapore, and now in the United States. So we still have ways to go, but there's certainly more available science and evidence to us right now than what it was before. So a lot of people are still practicing based on old evidence that is in place, and it has to do with basically operator experience and their personal experience from what they've seen in their centers as far as management of these patients. There's the issue of expertise. And although we had mentioned that, for instance, placement of indwelling tunnel pearl catheter is fairly straightforward, again, it does take uh, practice in order to achieve um, competence with these type of procedures, especially when you want to combine them with uh, medical thoracoscopies or pleuroscopies, and that requires a higher level of training that is only available up to a couple years ago in few centers around the country and certainly has been expanding. There's a, a main element of availability of chemical pleurodesis agents. There had been a period of time where talc or graded talc in particular was not um, easy to find in the United States compared to some of the European countries. Mm -hmm. And that played a role as well in utilization of that uh, 
uh, product in chemical pleurodesis. And a lot of people started looking at alternatives such as doxycycline and other uh, agents. However, right now there's more wider availability of, of talc. So I think, you know, we've uh, addressed uh, many of these factors or issues over the past couple of years. And uh, I'm very excited about the coming years, especially the next uh, five to 10 years, where I think we're going to see a large number of um, evidence coming out in support of some of the practices that we um, do right now and other practices that might come up in the future. Absolutely. This is arguably one of the most exciting uh, fields in uh, IP. Uh, and again, I would add that there, there's probably some training bias in these uh, techniques too. I was trained to do this. So uh, despite the lack of robust evidence, it's something that I have made a routine in my practice. Mm -hmm. But uh, what about you, Dr. Rafek? Are you routinely doing this in your center? Uh, we are doing, we do uh, all of these techniques um, individually. We have started combining some of these techniques in the last two or three years. And uh, we have uh, established a protocol where patients who come in with malignant pleural effusions that undergo fluoroscopy procedures, whether it's uh, for the purpose of pleural biopsies or for uh, talc pleurodesis will undergo placement of an indwelling tunnel pleural catheter at the same time. The main driver behind our decision to combine these procedures was, was basically to shorten the length of stay, which has now been moved to zero, meaning that these patients have now been moved to the outpatient setting. And that is um, very appealing for patients who do not have to endure a hospital stay. It is very appealing for the hospital, which likes to move these pr procedures to the outpatient setting. And uh, I think for us, you know, it's been satisfactory because we have, uh, again, eliminated the need for um, discussions with uh, multiple other uh, providers while in the hospital and having other teams involved while patients are in the hospital for management of their chest tubes for the duration of their stay, with, which could be numbered by days. So that was the main rationale for us moving towards this approach. However, um, as we've noticed, uh, and you've alluded to at the beginning, there has been uh, you know, more data in the last couple of years to support such practice. And uh, we are continuously looking at ways to adjust our current pr protocol in, in ways that would uh, be beneficial for our patients. And at the same time, we'll achieve the stated goals of uh, cost saving for um, uh, patients and for the healthcare system in general. Perfect, perfect. Uh, so what I would like to discuss next is uh, the technique used, but I'll go backwards just because you mentioned about um, uh, hospitalization length being zero days. So my personal concern always has been that, you know, after you give tag, there's usually an exudative phase and uh, sometimes they have more fluid production in you know, the first day or two. So I've been biased by uh, by training uh, and not experience to to you know watch these patients in the hospital uh, maybe for a day or two. So when you send your patients home after talc insufflation with an IPC, uh, how often do you ask them to drain for the first few days? We usually ask them to drain uh, daily for at least the first week before we see them for the first uh, post-operative visit. Okay, perfect. And then um, reg as regards with the technique, so uh, something that I've noticed in a few cases that I've done, it's just better to place the IPC first and then do the insufflation just because the visualization is difficult. Is that what you do always? Um, not necessarily in all cases. And as I mentioned, you know, the cases that we've combined uh, talc insufflation with an IPC placement has been uh, a uh, few cases uh, to date, uh, the more common approach that we do is uh, taking pleural biopsies and then placement of an IPC and uh, allowing patients to go home. However, in the cases that we've done, it has varied from uh, the technique that you had just mentioned right now with placement first at the IPC and then performing the insufflation versus uh, performing the insufflation and then placement of IPC. Um, so I've personally done it uh, both ways, and I've seen it done both ways. So we have not settled on a specific protocol. Got it. So you are placing an IPC, but are you also placing a chest tube, or are you just connecting your IPC to a pleural vac post procedure? We are only connecting our IPC to a pleural vac post procedure with no chest tube placement. 
Perfect. Uh, just to clarify for the listeners that in the study by Reddy, both uh, an IPC and a chest tube were connected um, at the time of thoracoscopy to a pleural vac. In the study by Bouchaude, uh, only the IPC was connected and it alone was used for all subsequent drainage. And um, I mean, you know, the argument some people give for two tubes is that mm-hmm. that may clog the IPC and render it ineffective. Uh, there was one clogged IPC in the Bouchaude study at day three. Uh, have you had issues with that clogging the IPC ever? Uh, we've had issues with clogging later during the drainage phase, but we have not had any issues during times when we've uh, utilized that for uh, uh, talc use. And when it happens, you just flush it open? We flush it open at first, and if that works, then we resume drainage. If it does not work, then we uh, use uh, TPA to reestablish patency of the catheter. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, I've, I've heard a lot of uh, concern with, you know, that clogging IPCs. It's important to remember that the Care Fusion, Rocket Medical, Aspira IPCs, they're all 15.5 to 16 French, and no one ever worries about a dark slurry through a 14 French tube. Uh, so I don't think this uh, should be a big issue. Uh, but however, in the IPC plus trial, blockage of the IPC occurred in 4% of the patients in the placebo group and 6% in the dark group. Uh, just with regards to your technique of uh, using TAC, uh, what dose are you using? Are you aiming for normal pleura? Are you only aiming at the parietal pleura? Uh, how, do you, how do you usually do your insufflations? Our uh, dose is five grams, and that comes from all the studies that have uh, utilized four to six grams uh, usually for uh, TAC insufflation. Um, our technique is to try to cover as much uh, um, space, if you will, uh, of the visceral and the parietal pleura without the uh, focus on any specific area. And what you're referring to is the uh, um, some of the, the argument that has been made that uh, uh, given that uh, pleural fluid is produced and reabsorbed in the parietal pleura, and usually the normal pleura is the site for that, is to aim at those areas to try to reduce the uh, uh, production and uh, of uh, pleural fluid, which physiologically makes sense. Uh, however, we have not adapted uh, specific techniques when it comes to that. Perfect. Um, so again, to clarify on your drainage protocol one more time, uh, you said daily drainage for the first week, then you see them in clinic, and then you decide how, uh, thereafter how you're going to do it, or how, how do you do it from there? Yes, that is correct. Okay. So again, just for the listeners, in the study by Reddy, the IPC was drained three times on day one, twice on day two and three, and daily uh, thereafter, and the Bojaude study uh, drainage was once daily. Uh, Now, quick question for you, uh, Dr. Rafek. I mean, I think the physiology why combined pleurodesis would work better is that you're probably maintaining a dry space, right, Uh, Mm -hmm. by always keeping it dry. So why do you think there's this uh, discordance in the success rate of these four studies that I've mentioned compared to other trials. Just for example, when in the IPC plus trial, only 43% of the patients in the TAC group achieved pleurodesis at day 35. And if you go to day 70, it's only 51%. So why do you think there's this big discordance? Uh, that is very interesting. And it's a great point that you raised there. And one of the main issues when you look at the IPC plus study is that their drainage was intermittent, meaning that they uh, allowed for three drainages over a 10-day period, which comes down to an average of every other day as opposed to daily drainage. So that might have been mm-hmm. uh, one issue that uh, contributed to that lower number. Uh, another thing that uh, um, uh, I would personally think about is whether we have adequate distribution of talc when we do install that through the IPC in a slurry uh, format and whether you have uh, equal distribution uh, throughout the pleura. So, uh, that means, uh, you know, you have certain areas that uh, uh, receive talc better than other areas. And that's a theory, but it's something worth uh, looking into. And the other thing is that uh, in that particular trial, they waited until day 10 before they uh, determined which patients would benefit from uh, um, uh, talc slurry for patients who had an involving tunnel pleural catheter. So you would wonder whether moving that up uh, before day 10 or whether using a daily drainage as opposed to intermittent drainage or the combination of both might result in a higher rate of success and only uh, future trials would uh, be able to prove that. Absolutely. I know my bias is that, you know, every time a study comes out where 
slurry and insufflation are equal. <laughs> kind of a pinch. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, but it, it is it is very interesting. And although there there are some you know some small data out there to suggest that over the long run it's the insufflation part that is more successful, but again. You know, as far as looking at it from a statistical perspective, you're absolutely correct. They are at uh, equal uh, footage. Absolutely. I mean, only the studies by Stefani in um, European Journal of Cardiothoracic Surgery 2006, the study by Terra and Chess 2009, and the subgroup analysis uh, by in the Dressler study uh, showed that the insufflation was um, better. Otherwise, you know, cumulatively, if you look at guidelines too, uh, the two are equal. So, yes. any. This has been absolutely fantastic. I know I've learned a lot uh, through this discussion. Any closing comments? Uh, again, I appreciate having you, uh, having me uh, uh, today to, to discuss this uh, very important topic. And uh, uh, again, I you know, would like to say that I'm very excited about what the future uh, will bring to uh, this important field in management of pleural disease in, in general and malignant pleural fusion in uh, particular. And uh, we have since um, learned a lot of information about not only the uh, difference between uh, uh, different techniques, but also how to best utilize a specific technique. There's more emerging data right now about the utilization of tunnel pleural catheter, both from uh, patient satisfaction as well as from healthcare cost perspective. And uh, although that wasn't the subject of discussion today, but there's more to come about. Uh, the utilization of tunnel pleural catheter uh, in, generally in patients with malignant pleural effusion and the need to really have a more precise approach to each patient individually, taking into account a lot of factors, including some of the uh, inflammatory markers that might be seen in that space, mm -hmm. ranging to uh, uh, financial uh, uh, aspects that might uh, play a role in uh, management of those patients. and. Oftentimes, we place tunnel pleural catheters only to realize after that there's an issue with uh, maintaining uh, visiting nursing services or um, the ability to uh, obtain supplies going forward. So there's a lot of uh, uh, a lot of excitement about uh, studying this further, and uh, uh, I look forward to um, seeing all that data coming out uh, in the near future. I know there's a lot of studies taking place right now, both in the US and in the UK, especially uh, and uh, other parts of, of Southeast Asia. So more to come on that front. And uh, I'm very excited about it. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time today and uh, all your words of uh, wisdom. I think it's only appropriate that we discussed uh, talc insufflation on the day we both experienced the first snowstorm here in New York City. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> right. Thank you, Dr. Afek. Thank you very much for having me. With that, we conclude an exciting episode here on the AABIP podcast. I hope you guys enjoyed listening to it as much as I enjoyed hosting it. Do also check out our website, theippodcast.com, and please do provide us with feedback and suggestions on what topic and which expert you want to hear next. Until next time, take care. Thank you.